One philosopher who influenced my thinking. Nagarjuna, obviously a person I'm working on. Rene Descartes. The philosopher Anne Conway. Is there a philosopher who's influenced you and could you talk about their ideas or one of their ideas? The philosopher who's influenced me a lot is David Hume, the great Scot. And Hume was, was a, a prolific philosopher who had ideas about perception, the mind, uh, the external world, but he also wrote about philosophy and about politics. And Hume was actually somebody who, in his life, had a uh, tremendous uh, time discussing uh, ideas with, with others. He was uh, a great friend to a number of people. He lived in Paris for a long time. The French thought of him as Le Bon David, a person who spoke excellent French. He was um, convivial. He knew that socializing was important. He knew that we shouldn't get too obsessed by philosophy. And he also knew that we should pay attention to our bodily experiences. He was a man of the senses. He wrote a, a, a wonderful essay, The Standard of Taste, when he tries to decide why we can say some judgments of taste are better than others. But also, you know, for a Scot in the 18th century to say reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions, to admit that we're more moved by our gut feeling and by our emotions than we are by cold rationality, that was a daring thing to say because a lot of Scots like to think of themselves as very reasonable, but they're also boiling up with their feelings and their passions, and Hume nailed that. So he's a huge influence on my thinking. So w one philosopher who influenced my thinking a lot um, was Frege. So Frege's project was to develop a logical system that would sort of allow us to reason in a gap-free way. Um, but at the same time, I mean, he's, he's known to be one of the most, well, perhaps the most important logician there, there ever was. Um, but at the same time, when you read his text carefully, he was very much uh, clear on the fact that logic cannot answer all open questions. And in particular, logic cannot answer the question how it is that we gain logical knowledge, how it is that we generate the knowledge we need in order to formulate logical axioms. So um, I was very interested in that idea of a sort of ineff ineffable kind of knowledge that would help us formulate logical axioms. And I then found um, uh, a contemporary philosopher working on exactly that, Adrian Moore, and his philosophy has influenced uh, my thinking a great deal because he actually makes a very compelling argument for the fact that there are ineffable kinds of knowledge and they're everywhere and it's perfectly coherent to argue for those. So that was, that was quite an eye-opener for me. So up until 20 or 30 years ago, people would commonly say there were no women in the history of philosophy up until maybe 1950. Like, women just didn't do philosophy, they didn't exist. And over the last 20, 30 years, there's been a huge recovery project to go back into the archives and old books and say, actually, no, there were quite a lot of women floating around. And what's more, they had really cool philosophical things to say. So, for example, um, the philosopher Anne Conway, she's active in the mid 17th century. She has a reply to Descartes account of what the world is. So Descartes thought that our world is made up of bodies and minds, that these are two different kinds of substances, that that raises a big interaction problem. For one thing, if God, who is supposed to be a big immaterial mind, interacts with the world, how is God an immaterial being creating things like bodies? And then how are our minds interacting with our bodies. It seems like there are two interaction problems there. And Conway just wants to solve this by saying, everything that exists is fundamentally immaterial. And she gets rid of both interactions in one fell swoop. And she builds up this picture of the world full of little immaterial creatures that are all interacting with each other in different ways. Some might seem a bit more like minds, some are a bit more like bodies, but fundamentally they're all the same living thing. Epictetus was one of the major Stoic philosophers uh, from the second century. 
and he has this beautiful way of, of uh, expressing these thoughts. He said that we should look at our impressions. An impression in Stoic terminology is your initial opinion about something. Uh, so for instance, that, oh my gosh, I have the interview and this is stressful. This is a stressful situation. That's an, that's an opinion. That, that's expressing an opinion. Well, who is expressing the opinion? The interview is just a fact of life. It's not, the interview doesn't come with opinions. You are expressing that opinion. And so you can challenge yourself and say, wait a minute, why am I thinking this way? Why, why, why not try to think about things in a, in a different way? And that actually does work. There is pretty good empirical evidence that, it, you know, it's not a silver bullet. So it's not like you start doing this tonight and then all of a sudden your life is fine. Um, but if you do it on a regular basis, you learn to challenge your own impressions, your own opinion, your own judgments. Then little by little, uh, you, it will become easier and easier. And at some point, you'll stop having those kind of uh, distressing. Uh, that's where the stereotype of the lack of emotion comes from. It's not a question of, of suppressing emotions. It's, it's a question of controlling and interacting with your negative thoughts. I mean, the, the, the guy had, uh, was an incredible person. He started out his life as a slave. Uh, and then he was freed, um, started st studying Stoic philosophy, became the most famous uh, philosopher and uh, teacher in, uh, in second century Rome. He had an incredible sense of humor um, and he, had, he was blunt with his students, he just told the thing as he, as he saw it. So one, for instance, one of my favorite quotes uh, from Epictetus says, um, so I have to die. Well, one of these days I'll have to die. Apparently this is not the day, but now I'm hungry, so I'm going to go and take lunch because that's under my control. And then when death comes, you know, we'll, we'll deal with it at that point. Well, I'm, you know, my, my, my unfashionable uh, choice will be René Descartes as a, a classical thinker, who I think, you know, was of course the founder of modern epistemology, in fact, was responsible for making epistemology the, one of the central fields in philosophy. And um, he is despised these days for making too much of the subjectivity of human experience, starting from within instead of from without, and trying very hard then to explain how it is that we get from inside our own heads out. People really favor these days reversing the order of explanation. To my mind, they, they lose the subject matter. I think subjectivity is an extremely important part of human experience and um, the, the, the insights that Descartes had both about the nature of the mental, his particular consciousness and his distinction from the physical, as well as the epistemological task that we have in explaining how we can know anything outside our own heads, still the right way of posing most of these issues. Um, as far as a contemporary author goes, depends what you mean by contemporary. Um, though I, and I, you know, one person who has influenced me a great deal is, is, is Ludwig Wittgenstein, who is the great anti-Cartesian thinker. And one of the things that's wonderful about him is because, you know, he was an extremely deep and searching thinker, sometimes very hard to understand. Um, but he un so well understood the temptations of the Cartesian point of view and of the Cartesian setup that it, although he was dead set against it, it worried him day and night. And so you get a lot of insight, both about the Cartesian view and what might be its limitations from thinking about Wittgenstein's work. Yeah, well, I think the, the entire uh, classical Indian tradition is a huge philosophical tradition that is, you know, as in, uh, in complexity, at, at least as complex as the, the entire ancient, uh, uh, ancient Greek and Roman tradition. So there's, there's a lot of material there. And um, I mean, I would in general be very happy if uh, people became more aware of that as part of the history of philosophy. Yeah? Um, but I think th they are, w within that, they are, um, uh, uh, a couple of really um, interesting thinkers that um, uh, should be uh, should really be part of all philosophy cur curricula. So um, uh, Nagarjuna, obviously a person I am working on, 
but also from, from the classical Indian side, um, we have people like Vatsyana, Vatsyayana, so the, the commentator on, on early Nyaya material, which has a lot, of, a lot of very interesting things to say in metaphysics, epistemology, and logic. So I mean, these, are, these are some of the really big figures, and I would very much hope that they become better, better known and, and more appreciated in the, in, the, in the kind of global philosophical context. Because I think philosophy in the Western tradition is often meant to be about argument, and argument's a big role. But I think all the best philosophy is also about the very, very careful attending. And I think there are lots of examples of that. Perhaps just to give one is that all the films of the Coen brothers, I think, are fascinating. They're, they're very, very diverse. But I think in all those films, I think you see some very important, I'd say, philosophical insight. Into, into ethics and morality actually, what it means to be a good person and what the difference is between a good person and a bad person. And I think if you look at a lot of Coen Brothers films, you, you, you get kind of three archetypes which keep recurring. There's the kind of, there's the complete sadist or the, com the com person who's completely outside of the moral domain who just has got a moral bone in their body, the sort of embodiment of evil. But then you have the kind of like the, the pure in heart, if you like, who are actually often quite simple, straightforward people. They're not philosophers, but they're just good and decent. And then you have these people who are, who are corrupted by degrees. They're not evil, wicked people, and yet something, things happen, chain of events. They allow themselves to be corrupted and often do really bad things. And, you know, without sort of going into detail about the, the films do this in, in different ways, so many of their films are in a way showing us, rather than arguing for us, um, important truths about what it means to be a good person in a world where there's so much temptation to do wrong. I've been influenced by many thinkers, and it's so wonderful to have this, but I'm going to single out Mary Midgley, the wonderful English philosopher who died recently, and is sorely missed, I have to say. She was a character, really interesting person, but also had some wonderful ideas. And she says, look, reality is so complex, we need multiple maps to try and make sense of its different aspects. You know, there's one map from science, there's another from ethics, another from religion, and we've got to try and do superimpose those maps and get the most we can out of them. I think that's a wonderful idea. I'd love, if unfortunately I can't do this if she were here, to ask her how do we draw those maps? But I know what she means and I think it's helpful. Drawing maps, getting them right and then putting them together and seeing the bigger picture that emerges from those individual maps. Um, I mean I guess a, a uh, perhaps not very obvious influence. I was brought up in the um, depths of Wittgensteinian world. I was actually an undergraduate and later a research fellow at St. John's College, Oxford, where um, Peter Hacker and Gordon Baker held um, sway <laughs> at the time. And um, so all my early education was deeply shaped by Wittgenstein, and I still find him an enormously um, important influence, even though sometimes I'm not quite sure why. Um, I think, I mean, I'm still, um, find and I'm, I'm enormously impressed by the famous or infamous private language argument um, uh, you know, the, the, which I think does um, show that most of the history of philosophy that we all uh, teach and are taught at under, as undergraduates sort of you know the Descartes to uh, you know Descartes, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, Spinoza, Leibniz you know all this tradition is based on a fundamental mistake as a pretty powerful um, observation but it's you know I think we we all know how to make our students think that way we always sometimes we don't know how to stop them thinking that way so maybe they really do go out of our you know um, lectures thinking that um, there are no tables, just ideas inside their heads. Uh, so um, this, is, this is certainly um, a very major influence, though probably not always that obvious in my work. Thank you very much. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.